Submit it for the approval of the Midnight Society. Oh, joy! Let's rock! It makes me wanna fight! Dear Journal, it's me, Doug. Do you have it? Baby's gotta do what a baby's gotta do. <laughs> On your mark, get set. Oh, here it goes. Welcome to Splat Attack, where we're taking it back to the slime filled past. I'm your co host, Brett. I am your other co host, Alex. And Brett, we've talked about Nickelodeon quite a bit. I, I think we should make it a little more childlike. Oh, yeah? Well, I got something for you because. Burr, burr, burr. We're going to talk about favorite 90s Nick Jr. shows today. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Wow. I, I'm just flooded with childhood memories right now. I can barely speak because um, <laughs> this idea came to me last week, even though we already had some other episodes in mind for the next few coming ones. For some reason, you just posting a photo of Sharon Lewis and Bram on uh, Instagram <laughs> was like, unlock the floodgates. <laughs> Here's all my memories from my early childhood from age like zero to three. So that's why we're here today. And hopefully all you listeners who uh, remember Nick Jr. from the 90s or have children who watch Nick Jr. will tune into this episode because we got a lot of fun things headed to you. And I I feel the need to preface whenever we talk Nick Jr. I mean, it's like Nickelodeon uh, when we talk about it. It's not just the Nick original content. Because mm-hmm. those who grew up with Nickelodeon in the late 80s and early 90s, Nickelodeon was really trying to find its footing with a lot of the acquired programming. So you've got things from Canada, you've got the animes, and then you've got the Nick original stuff. And it all was just chucked right into Nick Jr. and Nickelodeon and the just dissected it between two different age groups. If it was on Nickelodeon, and for this episode in particular, Nick Jr., it's fair game. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we got a little bit of everything, and... Uh, as we're going to discuss our favorite 90s Nick Jr. shows together, our top five, actually, you're, you're going to see a little bit of like original shows, a little bit of syndicated and a little bit of everything. I even have some honorable mentions of shorts, too. So, you know, you're, you're going to get a sampler plate of what it was like to watch Nick Jr. in the 90s, which I hope you enjoy because many of these lovely shows are still hiding on the Internet, like on archive.org. Um, as well mm-hmm. as YouTube, Daily Motion, and other random places that support keeping this old footage from decades ago alive. Um, let me give a, a very, very brief history of Nick Jr. It was a block of programming beginning on Nickelodeon on January 4th, 1988, focusing solely on educational shows for younger kids five and under, much like how Nick's split into Nick at Night for older folks who grew up with classic sitcoms of the 1960s to 70s. Up until the premiere of Eureka's Castle, which was the first original programming designed for Nick Jr. in 1989, shows in this block consisted of syndicated imported shows such as Maya the Bee, Maple Town, and The Noozles. Sadly, there wasn't much original content focused on Nick Jr. in its early days until 1994, when three shows, The Busy World of Richard Scarry, Alego's Rindo, and Gullah Gullah Island all premiered, much like Nicktoon's original debut in 1991 with Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy. However, unlike that animation block, Richard Scarry aired first on March 9th, while the other two both premiered on October 24th of that year. Following this lineup, the shows began trickling in with Little Bear in 1995, Blue's Clues and the Wubbliest World of Dr. Seuss in 1996, Franklin in 1997, and many more to follow, including Dora the Explorer, which was pretty much Nick Jr.'s version of SpongeBob in terms of its longevity. Yes, yeah, that show was a powerhouse of Nick Jr. But we'll, we'll talk more about that later. For now, let's jump right in, shall we? Let's do it. So, Slimesters and Gatgoids, this is our top five picks of our favorite 90s Nick Jr. shows. Starting with number five, burr, burr, burr. <laughs> Sharon, Lois, and Bram, The Elephant Show. <laughs> This one isn't technically a 90s show, but it definitely ran reruns on Nick Jr. until 1994, so I'm still counting it. The original run aired in Canada via the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation from 1984 to 1989, and it lasted about five seasons and featured a talented trio of performers, Sharon Hampson, Lois Ada Lillenstein, and Bram Morrison. We also can't forget about that titular elephant mascot played by Paula Gallivan, who would frequently act around mimicking whatever Sharon Lewis and Bram were doing for their uh, sketches, concerts, and what have you on their Young Geared Variety Show. What are some memories that you have? What was it about the show that you liked? 
Oh, geez. Yeah, great question. Um, well, the elephant show, you can't really think about without, you know, the elephant in it. They had a nice little 2D animated segment that bookended the show after the live action footage was shown. And it featured like an elephant on a spider web. And I think Sharon was singing a song that he was like dancing to and avoiding the spider. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was good fun. And a lot of uh, late 80s, early 90s shows had that like animated style to their um, title cards and whatnot. So it was cool. I also remember a lot of the concerts that they did in front of like young kids and they're they're all like singing along kind of like with Raffi, Fred Penner and what have you like for some reason that that whole genre of like adults singing to kids and occasionally using acoustic guitars was very popular in that time period and uh, yes. they definitely took it to the max with their show as well. I remember a few select episode memories uh, mainly this one where they're in the park and there's this guy um, I forgot his name, but he's the other guy who's on the show. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, he has a beard, and he, like, yep. sometimes has hidden talents. And he, I remember him in the park one time, like, playing music with, like, a washboard on his on his chest with, like, a honking horn, kind of like uh, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins with that whole contraption he had. I also remember a bunch of jugglers who, like, threw these giant bowling pins with each other, a bunch of tap dancing mimes. I think they did a puppet show for one episode. It, it's pretty much your standard fare, like children's variety show for back then. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, they had the concert segment where they actually showed them like on stage singing to an audience full of children and their parents. Uh, they occasionally sing on the shows. They would do like these little sketch comedy things. Occasionally they would have a special guest on the show too, who would either also sing or perform their hidden talent, kind of like what would you do? And they tied it all together with like a very loose plot. But if that wasn't enough, we all can't forget the thing that I'm kind of nudging, the elephant in the room. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, would that be the end song? Yes. Yes, it would be. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it's, I'm restraining myself as hard as possible, not trying to mimic it right now. Because when I watched this show at my grandmother's, when I was like a very young kid, I like did all the mime gestures and everything to the song. It's one of those, as soon as you hear it, it Ugh. will not leave. It's like the lamb chop sing along song that never ends. Once yes. it's there, yes. it is not coming out. It'll it'll like come through the living room like a wrecking ball. It'll <laughs> decimate everyone's <laughs> minds and get into your ears like the the catchiest earwig. You know, if I'm gonna sing it, you're gonna all have to sing along to at home when you're listening to this podcast episode once it releases. It's like me resisting the pressing the history erase button in Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> So hard. Not that to. shiny red button. Do 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 So All that's right. my number five pick. Enough about that. Let's hear about yours, Alex. What's your number five? My number five has a bit of a tie-in with The Elephant Show. Fred Penner's Place. Ooh, I like that one. That one, I believe, also came from Canada and mm -hmm. ran from 85 to 1997. So the show... Yeah, it lasted a, a long a, time. It had a huge run and... A, a, According to Wikipedia, which is not always the most accurate of sources, but according to Wikipedia, it has 900 episodes. Holy cow. I have no idea if that's accurate or not, but that sounds insane. I was going to say, we should ask the real Fred Penner on Twitter because I actually found his Twitter page while researching for this episode. Yes. Yes, we'll have to ask him that. Apparently he's still performing too, which good on him. He's like in his yeah. 60s or 70s now. Fred Penner's place, uh, that show, at least what it reminded me of, was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood set in the woods. Pretty much. <laughs> it's it's just a fun, soothing, friendly show. 
it was one of the few shows that I would watch on Nickelodeon and just vegetate. He'd have the puppets. He'd have he'd always enter through, through the log. log. Uh, he would have visitors who would come through. I mean, it is Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood with that little folksy acoustic singing. And it yeah. was it was fine. It was fine. It wasn't anything fantastical. But when you're four, three, four years old, you don't need everything to be fantastical. Sometimes you just need to get away from the insanity that Nickelodeon has to offer and just chill out. It's it's a volume for children, is what it is. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I I actually watched this show quite a bit along with Elephant Show growing up, and I liked it because it was very nature themed, and that's probably why I have such a fondness for nature. You know, him and and doing Boy Scouts growing up, I would say, are the biggest influences on me. But I I always found it just very cool and exciting to see him like journeying through this wooded terrain to get to his like little secret hideout that was through the hidden log. And he would just kind of hang out in there and play songs with you as if you were in a secret club and no one else, no one else knew about it. There was like no troubles that were in there. It was just like peaceful, happy, simple entertainment. And that's all you needed. Like it, it was such a joy to watch him. It's he's kind of like the Bob Ross of Nick Jr. I'd like to put yeah. it because he's just very soothing to watch and engage with his like interactions. That is all I have for my number five pick. What about your number four? Well, number four is going to get animated because we're going to the busy world of Richard Scary. Mm. I love this. I love this show so much. It's like an animated children's book. Um, it aired March thirteenth, nineteen ninety four, and lasted until nineteen ninety seven. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the month or day when it ended, but, you know, close enough. And it featured Huckle the Cat and Loli the Ringworm traversing across town to help their fellow citizens with their problems. Uh, frequent side characters include Hilda Hippo, who's kind of clumsy and often seen roller skating around town. There's also a Bananas Gorilla, who seems to screw up the simplest tasks in a silly <laughs> way. Uh, there's the lovable yet forgetful Sergeant Murphy. Uh, who rides around, you know, helping people as well. There's the danger-prone Mr. Fumble, who would always be chasing his green fedora. He's the pig guy in uh, green. I think he drives a pickle, too. Just a few other characters to mention. There's Dr. Lion, the humble doctor who would heal any busy town person rushed to the yard. There's Mr. Fix-It, who is my personal favorite. He was the handy-dandy fox who could fix anything in town, even if it did, like, blow up in his face. Of course, there's Loli the Ringworm and Huckle the Cat as the, the main duo that we'd see through various adventures. I just get warm, fuzzy feelings whenever I watch this because it hits me right in the spot. I think it was one of the contributors to me, like, learning how to draw and pursuing animation just because the style is very, like, rounded and approachable and very soft. I didn't have uh, Richard Scary anywhere on my list, so I Aww. will I will weigh in on on this one. A theme you're going to notice with me, as far as Nick Jr. goes, mm -hmm. was that as a kid, un unless it was early uh, late '80s and super early '90s, anything that came out from like '92 and on, I was no longer the demographic that Nick Jr. was aimed toward. And gotcha. I'd be off school for election day or president's day. One of those mm -hmm. holidays that the parents had to go to work, but the kids didn't. And then I'd be sitting there with Price is Right or Bob Ross. And then once those, <laughs> were, once those were gone, it was, you've got to watch Nick Jr. Because that's all that was on. Or you're watching a soap opera or something on VHS. I had a lot of frustration with Nick Jr. because it's not my demographic. I just felt like I was being talked down to, and it frustrated me. As, a, as, as an older kid, even yeah. though I was older, I didn't understand that, oh, yeah, this isn't for my group. This is for kids who are much smaller than me. But uh, a theme you'll notice is, as a kid, it frustrated me, and then I grew up and then realized what they were actually doing, and, right. and it's not made for me. And right. now as a, a parent, I appreciate it far more than I did as a kid. So my opinion will change very, very much. But Richard Scarry was in that point of, I don't like the show. This show is fine. This show really is fine. Uh, it was just, it didn't leave that much of an impression on me as a child. The mm -hmm. only impression I really have were those toys from Wendy's where you had Oh the, yes. You had the little building, plastic building with a card that would slide yep. into the building and I think it was double sided so you could see different mm -hmm. characters in different windows. Outside yep. of that, I don't no, and I think there was a rug 
there was a Richard Scarry rug that was in the shape of a map that uh, uh-huh. you could put down. You could like preschools. put race cars on. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are the only two real big things that I my my big takeaways mm-hmm. from Richard Scarry. I actually remember like McDonald's or Burger King doing Richard Scarry toys too. Like, um, I definitely remember having Loli's Apple helicopter. Yeah. Car thing oh gosh. And just rolling that around. Yeah. So I'm I'm sure they did like toys of that variety as well. But I'd have to dig deeper into the the corners of the internet to find those things to see if they still exist. Yeah. Wendy's um, toys and Burger King toys they get so overshadowed by the McDonald's toys. But anyways, um, I understand where you're coming from because part of the reason why I appreciated these shows and consequently the shows that you may not like as much for regular Nickelodeon is because I have younger siblings. I was the oldest of three growing up. So Mm -hmm. when they came around, Mm -hmm. I just watched shows with them as if I was, you know, big brother uh, showing them an example. So that's why some of these shows are actually on here for that reason, because I watched them with them, not by myself. And I learned to kind of, appreciate it from their perspective while absolutely you know bonding with my siblings and that makes a whole lot of sense because i am the youngest in my home yeah. and when with nobody around on those days that's all i had and i was oh, yeah. don't it could feel this. uncomfortable all right my number four is and some might be surprised to see it as low as it is considering but it's it's five little bear Ooh, little like bear is one. little bear is my number four uh, mm. Again, I know you'll talk about it later, but uh, because again, we're this is one of those that's on your list, but it's it's different. Yeah. Uh, but I and and I didn't look at your notes. I just saw that you're. I just saw your ranking. That's yeah, fine. But, Listeners don't uh, need to I'm, know until we get there. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to go into detail about the show because I know you will eventually. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, I can give you my impressions of it. And right, like I said earlier, it was right at that target age when I was just not into Nick Jr. It was just on as white noise, and I either had two reactions as far as Nick Jr. was, and and that was either, oh my gosh, shut up, I (laughs) want to watch something else, or it was, oh, this is okay. And Little Bear was in that category of, oh, this is okay. So like (laughs) eight-year-old me was like, okay, this is is fun. It reminds me of Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, exactly. and that's why I, I I tolerated it. I didn't like it as a kid. I tolerated it. Right. But whenever I talk Nick Jr. with my wife and I and I mention Little Bear, you get that. Oh, I love Little Bear. How can you not? Yeah, How can you honestly not like this show? It is such an innocent, cute, fun show. That's pretty much just where I'm coming from with it. I don't have any really memorable episodes. Because, oh, again, it, it, it didn't stick with me. It, it was just a, oh, it's passable. It's fine. I don't, sure. I don't dislike it. But, yeah, I think Little Bear succeeds because it's already anchored in familiar feelings when it comes to children programming. It's got that Winnie to the Pooh vibe to it. Um, it's adapted from a storybook series, much like Busy World of Richard Scarius. It already has a little bit of a pre-established audience. And on yes. top of that, it's, it's generally geared slightly older for older kids, like maybe five to seven it's a more contemporary feeling to it than like something that's pigeonholed into say a very narrow demographic. And as soon as you like turn three or four, then you're like, ah, the heck with this. I'm, I'm onto this show now. Little bear is something that I can even come back to as an adult, just because of that, like feeling of being in nature with all their friends. And it doesn't feel necessarily like a kid's show to me. All right. You're number three, sir. Okay, so this may be controversial for some of you uh, 30-somethings who are listening (laughs) because I definitely hated this show at first or whenever I watched it on my own. But the reason why I like this show is because I babysat my younger brother when he was born the same year as this show. And we used to watch it together growing up. And it was his like most favorite show to watch through that early childhood period. For my number three, it's Blue's Clues. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Blue, I didn't realize you came in here. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, where's Steve when you need him? Did you, speaking of which, did you see Steve's, uh, you know, message to the internet a a week ago? Who who has not seen that (laughs) by this point? Oh my gosh, it's everywhere. It's it's in places where it isn't even Nickelodeon-centric. Just on social media, period. Oh, Steve has risen from the dead i thought he was dead no he wasn't dead guys 
He's just a 50 something now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that makes me walking. feel old. That probably makes you feel old too, listeners. I think the giveaway was the hat because <laughs> you couldn't see his, <laughs> his big bushy hair underneath it like he used to have. Blues Clues. Um, this show aired September 8th, 1996 and ran until 2004 with a revival in 2019 and spinoffs including live performances and a show called Blues Room, which featured Blue as the host. Personally, <laughs> I'm just going to put this out there. This is kind of similar how I treat my SpongeBob. You know, when it comes to SpongeBob, and I can't believe I'm mentioning this on a Nick Jr. episode, but I only <laughs> count the first three seasons of SpongeBob as legit SpongeBob. Season four after that, crap, or not my demographic. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I recently rewatched the season four and five, and I hated it because it was such a dramatic shift in personalities and storylines, and it, like it tried so hard to be gross and stupid. And I'm like, oh, I, I had to burn the DVD. Not like burn it as and make a copy of it, like literally set it on fire in my trash can and send it to hell. Yes. But anyways, yes. the reason why I'm bringing up SpongeBob is, is because I treat Blue's Clues the same way. I'm kind of an early season purist. I treat Blue's Clues as Blue's Clues from when Steve first shows up in the very first episode to when Steve leaves for college and Joe, his brother, shows up. And things kind of take a different direction. Agreed. And it, it, you know, I, I feel like a lot of shows just... They, they have a longevity issue where they have to try harder and harder and harder to stay fresh. And, you know, anything that lasts long enough of an inevitably will have some low points to it. I didn't want it to get any worse than what it was because everything I saw for like the first three seasons were great. I love Steve. I love, you know, the whole interaction with the audience, which was very groundbreaking at the time, how it literally talked to the kids that the show was for and we could talk back to it as if he was listening to us because we didn't understand film editing and all that acting stuff it was also a mixed media show where he was essentially set on like a green screen and there are these like clay modeled things and paper cutout things that were arranged in his house just like kind of left to right so you kind of had a 360 panoramic view of his house as he was searching for clues so that's what really drew me in being an artist and even back then as a young child i was drawn into the style of the show more than anything and just how interactive it was i particularly loved the scene when he had to go into a picture frame or something outside of the house for the third clue just because it felt like you were going into another world with him and that just like triggered my imagination and feelings of fantasy and whimsy that i really loved whenever i'd watch it with my younger brother for that it i I, I can't hate it for that. It was it was a fun show, even if it is super popular now. Back then, it just felt like you had a really intimate connection with Steve and Blue and Magenta and Mailbox or Mailman, what, whatever his name is, the purple mailbox on, on the retractable thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's Mrs. Salt and Mrs. Pepe. Hello, hello, hello. And um, the soap bar that would talk and Shovel and Pail. Going along with that, my number three is also Blue's Clues. Whoa, no way! We have the same number! We got the same number! And it was not planned! Wow, but, cool. Uh, I was very much in the same boat as you, with the not liking it so much at first. Whereas you had your siblings to be able to grow with and, and enjoy it, I didn't. And this was another one of those cases of, I just couldn't stand the show as a kid. I, I couldn't stand it so much that I was yelling at Steve. Aww. <laughs> every single episode and again listeners and slimesters i know you guys the show has a lot of love which is appropriate the mm -hmm. show is very deserving of the love and affection that it gets i acknowledge that but my eight-year-old self did not acknowledge <laughs> that and, screaming internally <laughs> oh i wouldn't internally at all if it was <laughs> If it was a day when I was home and Nick Jr. was on and my parents were gone, I was yelling at the TV. Hey, do you want to help me find what Blue wants to do before he goes to bed? <laughs> no! Well, before she goes to bed. You're probably no! like, I've got a clue for you, and then punch your fist right through the television. Oh, gosh. Uh, you will? I said no! I, I swear, <laughs> I've probably learned how to use swear words by uh, at, interacting with this show. I hate hated this show as a kid well it's not for everyone but, <laughs> but the thing about it is it stuck in my brain and then my son uh who's now seven he was getting into it and actually 
it was my teacher when I was in third or fourth grade. I can't remember which one. I think it was third. Mm -hmm. But she changed my mind to it. We happened to have a picnic that day for school. But it was a picnic in our classroom because it was raining outside. And she turned on the television, which we never got to do. It was always Magic School Bus or it wouldn't, Bill Nye wouldn't even a thing yet. Oh, jeez. Uh, so it was um, just turn on the TV and, and watch whatever was on. So we'll turn it to Nick Jr. Nick Jr. is fine. And Blue's Clues was on. And the whole class, ugh. Oh, no. And she, my, my teacher, was, what are you guys groaning about? This is a very good, and it's that, it's that teacher, now guys, so don't right. be so hard. But she really pointed out that this is a great show for educating younger minds. It's not made for us. It's made for mm -hmm. toddlers and, right. and a little older. And it teaches how to do basic things, counting, uh, recognizing colors, and it's made for that demographic and that was the first time it really clicked with me of mm -hmm. oh oh well no wonder that i it's that i don't like it that much i've it's not I, meant it for never, you it's not meant for me but it's perfectly fine for kids who are younger than me and that started the shift for for my eight-year-old mind going okay i still don't like it but now I don't hate it. And then as I got older and my son got into it, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is this is nice. It's a nice, easygoing yeah. little mystery for small kids. It's it's a hide-and-seek pretty much, you know, find the clue. Right. But uh, I would find myself as an adult, even without my son, getting these songs out uh, every time, I, not every time, but several times whenever I get a package from Amazon and I go out to the mailbox, I, you know mail's what? Mail's here, doing. mail's here. <laughs> mail time, mail time, mail time. Right? We, we all did that. <laughs> yeah. And occasionally I'd get excited, and when I get excited, I'll just start rambling and making random noises. And occasion, on more than one occasion, I found myself going. Burp, burp, burp. And my son would right? Like Isn't it fun? Crazy. It stuck with me, and those ridiculous songs continued to change my affection for the show, even as an adult, to mm -hmm. the point where now I I really enjoy the show, and I highly respect what uh, Angela, uh, who was the creator, what she was doing, mm -hmm. and seeing all the different programs that she's done because she's done super Y and she's done Daniel Tiger's neighborhood mm -hmm. and she's doing the, the now running season of uh, uh, blues clues and you she's had a degree in child psychology and really wanted to change the way children's programming works. And I, I highly respect that. Me too. And I'm very, very appreciative now as an adult of what she has done. I wish I was able to appreciate this much more as a kid and mm -hmm. not grow and not going around with that anger and frustration. I, I had a horrible temper as a kid. I really, really like this show now. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, our, our perspective is very narrow and self-centered when we're younger and it broadens yes. as we explore new places. And I think that show itself can help broaden perspectives and help you reach new horizons too by showing us all the cool places we can go, whether it's Agreed. you know just inside your house outside in the backyard or you know even to a place that's in a painting i mean maybe not literally that last one but if they went to <laughs> say like an art gallery inside of a painting then it'll get uh, you more curious about going to art galleries or maybe what the jungle is like because they go visit a lion to help him find a clue while taking a, a sliver out of his paw you know stuff like that and considering that they use like 30 years of data conducted by television networks monitoring children's uh, watching viewing habits, a lot of it was also drawn from Sesame Street because they were the front runners of children's programming back in the yeah. 70s. It, it makes a lot of sense for how carefully crafted it was for that specific demographic. Later, they even integrated um, American Sign Language too to help people like bridge the gap uh, communicating with hard of hearing and deaf people, which I th say is very proactive. And now I see more curriculums integrated that as well in in school too so i think it's 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 great that it's it's doing its best to help educate the the young children's minds as much as it is to entertain them so that things stick things are easily digestible and understandable and they can start interacting and sharing with others in a proactive way agreed man i feel like with the way we talk about blue schools it should have been our number one <laughs> <laughs> but you know, for nostalgia purposes, I think both of us have some uh, that edge it out just a little bit more. Yes. So for my number two of favorite 90s Nick Jr. shows, it is 
Eureka's Castle. Who lives in Eureka's Castle? Eureka's Castle. Eureka's Castle. Yeah, I love I love that show it so much. Where do I even begin with that? Um, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure all my fellow uh, slimesters and gackoids will go nuts for this one because this is like the earliest one that I remember watching and absolutely loving. Yep. Like I even loved. Yep. I, I loved all the characters. Loved Bat, Batley, uh, Magellan, the dragon, who's like Eureka's man-child son, <laughs> for you know, to put it lightly. Um, there was uh, Mister Knack, who's the Tinker guy. He was pretty cool. Um, there was Bog and Quagmire, the Moat Twins, the the Singing Fish Trio, and the Fountain, which was pretty cool. And there also was the giant, of course. How could we forget him? Because at the beginning of every episode, he would stomp on over to his giant castle music box that was in the middle of a field and just wind it up. And suddenly the show started. It fit in so perfectly with the little animated title card that you just felt sucked in from the very beginning. And it didn't matter what characters you liked or disliked. Everyone was there to like have a good time and see what was going on in the castle because there was always something interesting, whether it's reading a bedtime story to Magellan or helping Batley find his glasses. It's just lots of fun. My number two is Eureka's Castle. Wow. We are, again, <laughs> simpatico with our number two Pretty spot. Pretty cool. Uh, Eureka's Castle was, that. there was nothing like that on Nick Jr. at the time. Nick Jr. was was still pretty much just all re-syndicated shows. Yeah. Uh, you did have some puppet stuff like on Fred Petter's Place, but this was the first almost pretty much all puppets in some form on the network. And it, it really surprises me to see the amount of uh, adults who are trying to think of this show and wondering if this was related or made by the same company that made the Muppets, if it was Jim Henson. But it was in, uh, I don't know if it was or not, but I do know that one of the ladies who, I think she did the puppeteering for Eureka, also did work for Jim Henson Hmm. and and his crew. Yeah, I I thought the puppets looked familiar, like if Jim Henson sculpted them specifically. It looks like his handiwork. Mm, I I don't think he did, but I'm pretty sure they probably got some influence and probably some pointers. But that's that's just speculation. I don't have any evidence of that. I don't really have any favorite episodes because it's been so long because that was one of the shows that was so incredibly hard to find all these years until it recently resurfaced on Paramount uh, Paramount Plus. I mean, you could find... A lot of stuff that you couldn't find that wasn't released on DVD on like Daily Motion and things like that, such as Welcome Freshman yep. and uh, Salute Your Shorts. But Eureka's Castle was just, it, it was in the abyss. Yeah. You, you couldn't find it anywhere. And now that it's on Paramount Plus, which I do not have, I, I would like to watch those again. Same here, um, man. <laughs> I remember how much I enjoyed that show. And it's amazing how we can relate so much of our lives and tie it to something that we care very much about. And Nickelodeon is is one of those. I can tie my life to so many different points due to a movie or a TV show. And Nickelodeon was always on, so I can tie right. much of my childhood. And I remember being in my aunt's house uh which she's not lived in in years but i remember being in there sitting in her living room floor and eureka's castle being on while my mom had to go to work and i had to wait for afternoon kindergarten because at the time kindergarten was split between a.m and Mm p.m and i was in the p.m segment and i remember the pizza hut puppets and i remembered the the bumpers just before they would go to a commercial that eureka right magellan and the theme song it was such a 
fun, creative show, and I couldn't get enough of it as a kid. And I wish more of the the episodes stuck with me, but Nickelodeon would completely erase everything that I remembered from Eureka's Castle by the afternoon. Yeah. At least as far as my brain. Yeah, I think it's because it's a very approachable show, and the shows that Nickelodeon had after Nick Jr. was over around like 2, 1, 2 p.m., somewhere around there. It was just dynamite, one after another, wild and crazy shows, (laughs) including wild and crazy kids that would just grab your attention nonstop. Yeah. And then... Eureka's Castle is just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just relax and sit back while I watch this, and then you know wait before I go nuts to see what would happen in like I don't know Rugrats or Doug later. It, it was a great show, I loved it. Before we move on to our number one, I just want to mention you know how you were saying that you can like connect points of your life to shows when you're like going throughout mm-hmm. your life. For me, this takes me back to when I lived in my very first house. This was before my brother was born and i think even before my sister was born too because she was in 91 i was 88 so i got like the very very tail end of yurka's castle there and it was like a little like two bedroom house set in in the corner of a neighborhood at the bottom of a hill and i was in the living room in my little crib jumping around my parents were working my dad uh, is in construction my mom's accountant so they had to go off to their businesses and I just remember that being my babysitter, having the little Magellan doll that I think you got from Pizza Hut. I think Magellan, Mm -hmm. Eureka, and Batley were all like dolls you can get at Pizza Hut if you paid like a little bit extra, like $2 or something ridiculously cheap. Yeah. Um, And I would just sit back and watch it and just take it all in. And I remember that because I liked how Magellan looked, especially with his like Hawaiian pastel shirt that he was wearing. He looks like he could be on Miami Vice with that shirt. (laughs) That developed my my love of dragons. And I was also born in the year of the dragon. So that kind of lines up in a cool synchronistic way. And I do remember that there was an episode, I think it was the Christmas special, and that actually Mm -hmm. premiered on Nick at Night. Uh, oh before. yeah because they wanted families to see it better than like for christmas yes. eve and, and i think that was one of the very very few times if not the only time nick jr had a show that played during nick at mm-hmm. night uh, i know there were some times when nick tunes would be extended right. into nick at night hours but uh, a handful of times yeah. but that was the only time we had a nick jr show on nick at night yeah that, i guess that ju- goes to show how um influential it was when it first came on the scene since it was like the first original programming nick jr did great pick just before we move on the episode that i do remember from the back of my mind uh, as it's being triggered now is the episode when magellan can't go to sleep and he's like bugging eureka for like a glass of water or can you read me a bedtime story and he's just like coming with all these excuses to get her to like pay attention to him and i remember it being so silly because i had insomnia growing up so i guess i could relate to his restlessness kind of like he did too and there's like times in the episode where he would like look at his blanket i think I think the little blue dots on his blanket quilt thing were called the Blanketeers, and they'd like make different shapes uh, in the quilt patch, which was pretty cool. And then at one point, Batley couldn't sleep in the belfry, so he, he came in when Magellan wasn't there, and he like perched himself on his ceiling, and because he came back after he got his drink of water or whatever, he got freaked out by Batley and didn't recognize him, so they both thought when they freaked out and left Magellan's lair that the other one was a monster, and so <laughs> Eureka had to kind of talk him down from the ledge to tell him, look, you're not, you're not having a nightmare, you're not imagining things, it's just your friend, see? <laughs> I guess that was very pivotal in helping me understand that you know maybe things we see in the night as young children aren't necessarily what our imagination makes them out to be so yeah there's that that recently deeply locked memory for (laughs) y'all my first honorable mention is maggie and the ferocious beast and this is also technically a 90s nick jr one though the majority of it aired in 2000 to 2002 uh august 24th 2000 to june 9th 2002 to be precise but the shorts when it was like you know interstitial stuff kind of like ambient dexter or a little big room on nick jr those started in 1998 and that's what really roped me into it because i really love the cute character designs and how they would go exploring together there was uh maggie who had this like little safari hat and blue overalls and she had like cute fluffy red hair kind of like little annie orphan and then there's hamilton the pig who had like a 
red H on his white sweater. And he was like the, the worry war of the group. Like, I don't know if that's such a good idea or gee, what do we do? And then of course there's beast. Who's like this big giant four legged, uh, yellow monster with three horns and red spots. And you'd think that would be frightening enough for little kids, but actually because of his calming voice and his very soft character design, he's very charming. And I always thought he was, he and like the rest of the cast were very fun in like how they encourage exploration and independent thought and kind of coming up with solutions on the spot. Or if they were running into problems during their adventures, like they didn't know how to cook when they had like ingredients to make something or like if they had to get over a mud puddle, but they didn't know how they would like come up with ideas using things from their box that they would take with them wherever they go. It's kind of like an endless box of stuff where car- cartoon hammer space existed. Um, so I just remember that being really fun and also watching that with my siblings, even though we were a little bit older then. <laughs> also beast phrase, great googly moogly. My other one is actually Fred Penner's place. Cause it was either that or the elephant show and it was a top five. <laughs> so sorry, Fred Penner, you got knocked into honorable mentions, but it's still a great show. I love the simplicity of it. I love its connection to nature. I really appreciate those like adults talking to kids, not down at kids on TV where they encouraged you to interact with them and feel like you're, you're safe and comfortable wherever they're having their show. And I just like this cool hideout. Like I wish I had one in the woods like his. I just didn't know where to build it. Well, my honorable mention <laughs> is The Elephant Show. Go figure. So I guess we got some uh, <laughs> synchronicity happening there, too. <laughs> wow. We did. For, for me, the Fred Penner's Place held my attention much more mm-hmm. than The Elephant Show. Uh, the animated segments that bookended were, they, they kept my attention fine. But in the middle, I don't know what it was about The Elephant Show that would lose my attention, but Fred Penner kept it. Mm. I, I don't do you, really know. Do you think know. it was Word Bird? Because he was pretty popular with the kids. I, it might have been. It, I, I, I don't know. I think often I was waiting to see more antics from the elephant, mm. and the elephant was was very much just in the yeah. background. And it was it was mostly Sharon Lois yep. and Bram. But the one thing I remember the most was a commercial during Nick Jr. when Captain Crazy Eyed Beard was. Have you seen Crazy Eyes? That's a guy. Because I, <laughs> no, that's he, the man has crazy eyes. I was looking for uh, clips of the Elephant Show a few mm-hmm. months ago. And there was uh, an episode where they talked about Halloween, mm-hmm. and he was dressed as a pirate. Who, Bram? And, and no, no, the the other guy that was, I don't know his name. I think it's Nick something. But he was he was bearded and yep. very, very light hair on top. And he, the camera was zoomed in on his face as a pirate, and the dude's eyes are crazy and creepy. Crazier and than... Christopher Lloyd's for, as Judge Doom from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know. I those think, those I are think pretty the... darn crazy. Like that's that's nightmare fuel for decades, kind of crazy. And, and Judge Doom didn't freak me out as a kid. That was my favorite segment. Really, I loved that part. Jeez, it did not freak me out. I wanted all. to shoot him with a bazooka as soon as he got that weird <laughs> baby hair and dagger eye thing going on. I'm honestly surprised that this guy on Elephant Show didn't creep me out because he's real. I, I yeah. knew. Judge Doom was was cartoons, but this guy is real, and he looks like he should have a restraining order or, <laughs> or, or, or something. But, I mean, he's he's fine. He's yeah. perfectly sweet and great with the kids, and I think that's why it didn't creep me out as a kid. I mean, he just felt like he belongs. You know, he's, he's somebody that you would feel safe around. But th- the commercial that I remember was him sitting down at a couch with a bunch of kids sitting on the floor, and he was mm-hmm. playing the guitar, and he was playing does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight that's a long-winded song name (laughs) yes it is yes it is but that was i mean he said that whole little segment and then it faded into sharon lewis and bram's elephant show only on nick jr Mm -hmm. but uh, that is the one commercial i remember from all nick jr shows interesting See, the, the guy with the rainbow on his shirt and the yellow shirt, um, he had a weird, like, long mushroom hair and dark hair. And he, like, played on guitar, and he had this song called, like, Nothing. Like, it was a song about nothing, and he sang the word nothing all the time. He creeped me out for some reason because I didn't like the way he smiled. He, he was, like, very bony and he had a very right wide grin like he was hiding a dark secret. 
So I don't know if that's true or not, but I would, I usually <laughs> left the room and looked for like cereal in the cupboard whenever he came on. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube if you want to see for yourself Slimesters and Gakoids. <laughs> Does he creep you out like he creeped me out? All right, and moving on to dishonorable mentions. Yes. We, I might get a lot of hate for this one, but for the reasons you hate. Not as much as me. (laughs) The reasons that I picked this as my dishonorable mention is the same reason why you disliked Blue's Clues at first. It was due to the repetition and just how, like, over the head they beat you over the head with it. Doesn't matter what age you were. When I watched it with my siblings, I was like, Okay, we get it. All right, you don't have to repeat it twenty times. Twice will do. Um, but you know, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. It's Dora the Explorer. And and you're you're on your own with that one. I've got yeah. no input on Dora. I, I mean, I, I'll I'll give her this. I don't I don't hate it so much that I want to bury her six feet under. I I do like <laughs> I do <laughs> I do like the art style. I think it's very conducive to being easy on the eyes for children. I do like the adventures that they go on. It's kind of like Maggie and the Ferocious Beast a little bit with the exploring. Um, what I don't like is just the, the repetition. and It almost feels a little too dumb for me, like too simplistic. Uh, granted, the repetition <laughs> did make me remember what grande and begeno mean in Spanish, and I didn't know Spanish at the time. <laughs> it's big and small because they advertised it in like cup sizes. So now when I go to Starbucks, I'll just say, hey, I want a grande coffee or I want a begeno coffee. But they're like, sir, we don't offer begeno size. It's just verde and grande. Pick it or get out. <laughs> uh, and then, oh. Don't even get me started on the map. He's like the mailbox from Blue's Clues ramped up to 11. Because he's like, I'm the map, 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 I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. And I'm just done at that point. Nope, turn the TV off. Walking away, going outside like a normal little child and getting in touch with nature and my ball. I'm glad that was singular. Yes. <laughs> so door is pretty much the spongebob of nick jr to me it lasted a little bit too long a little bit too simplistic for my taste but hey i'm sure it appeals to some people who appreciate it which i'm not knocking you if you do this is just my personal yep. experience my dishonorable mention is gonna step on a lot of toes and it is it is not meant to troll and i do feel the need to preface with i know every single time that we have something that we love just absolutely love and then someone says oh gosh i couldn't stand that you feel mm-hmm. attacked and, and yeah. it's like well, how can you and that's that's not that's not what i'm meaning to do listeners i'm not meaning to step on your toes or steal your thunder if you love this wonderful i'm glad you do and it is a bit of a cheat because it's not a show. Oh. But it is synonymous with Nick Jr. Uh-oh. What could it be? I could not stand face. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I... I, I cursed the episode because I opened with that. Oh, no. It, you, it, it, it's synonymous with Nick. You can't not talk about Nick Jr. Yeah. And, and avoid face. It's, it's impossible. Hi, face. They're here. Huh? Hey, that's not right. <clears throat> okay, here face, there hi. Oh, I messed up again. Okay, okay. Let me try one more time. Hi there, face here. Perfect. And just in time, because Papa Beaver's story time is next on Nick Jr. <laughs> so, I mean, he was like the spokesperson for Nick Jr. from 94, 95 to 2004. I mean, mm-hmm. the character was around forever. Yeah. And I, I was hoping as an adult having the track record, because I, didn't, I don't have a Nick Jr. show that I don't like. And, and again, I stopped watching Nickelodeon in 98, and I didn't see any of the Nick Jr. shows, gosh, from 95, 96. By the time I was home from school on those special holidays, I was playing video games until Nickelodeon came on. Makes sense. By then, we had, by then we had Super Nintendo. And Sega Genesis. 
and Sega Genesis. So I was playing those things. But yeah, in in 94 and 95, I saw a lot of face and I was hoping that my opinion of him would change as uh, as I grew up and became an adult, like like all the other shows had done, like Blue's Clues and Richard Scary. Nope. I've been doing all kinds of digging, looking for as much Nickelodeon stuff as I can find, including stuff I didn't like. Mm. And it amazes me that there is some stuff that didn't do as well, but there's still such a diehard fan base for them, like Space Cases and, and Cousin Skeeter, which right. didn't go very long. But, you know, there's there's a diehard fan base there. And Face is so revered among Nickelodeon and Nick Jr. fans. He just annoyed me. The, the constant high-pitched talking, that constant giggle, and I don't like people trying to make me happy. I think that's what it is. Even songs like Pharrell Williams' Happy and Come On, Get Happy by the Partridge Family, I mean, it started there. Mm-hmm. Anytime somebody tried to tell me how to feel, then you done made me mad. It's like, okay, I hate you, shut up. Face was always overly happy and joyous and <laughs> it's like, shut up up and i i still i still feel that way as an adult i was watching okay maybe my opinions changed i heard one segment nope not changed see that's interesting because this is where we (laughs) disagree a lot i don't love him but i do he made me very curious as a kid because i'm like wait a minute why is he just a face why is he (laughs) where's the rest of him can we like see him can we see the camera zoom out so we can see where his body is i feel like this is a problem oh gosh (laughs) Okay, you just, uh, I just thought of Nightmare on Elm Street Maybe, maybe he's an alien. I just thought of Nightmare on Elm Street 3 where Freddy Krueger came out of the TV. The TV just burst arms, and I imagine face now right in the middle of that, but still the TV is coming to life and attacking people. Oh my god. Uh, I'd, I'd watch that face. Hi there. Face here. <laughs> brew, brew, brew. Here to but invade your nightmares. Cha- <laughs> not even change. Not even change to a Freddy Krueger voice. Just keep that overly joyous, happy face. W- would he, but would he have the finger razors? <laughs> well, the, and the, hat. the the TV on the TV on the on Freddy. Uh, it, it just spawned arms. It didn't have the the. Oh. The knives. Freddy Krueger's head came out the top with the the rabbit ears oh, on top, right. which was ridiculous. Wow, geez. What a weird but, film. But not even not even have the Freddy Krueger head. Just keep face in it, and and if it spawned legs too, and then just walk around really creepy <laughs> with face. Just hi there, face here. Oh I'm my not going to see you for two whole days. Kill it, kill it with fire. <laughs> <laughs> that that honestly sounds like a character that belongs on Cartoon Network's regular show because they had a dancing cassette tape before that used to creep the hell out. You know, summertime loving for anyone who watches Cartoon Network, and that's what it makes me think of, like its cousin. So I, I can understand where you're coming from. He is a little creepy. He is a little too happy. And I'm also kind of in the camp of if you're trying too hard to make me happy, chances are I'm not going to be happy. But yep. for some reason, when I was a kid, I just associate all the different colors and all the different objects that would pop up on screen when he was like talking to me as interesting. I was very curious curious about him like why he changed colors and had all these things yet was just a face like was he related to the kool-aid man i don't know because he was red sometimes (laughs) so i liked watching him because he perplexed me not because i liked him necessarily and that's where i'm coming from so it's more of like a neutral positive than like a dislike or a positive all right slimesters please Please tell me if there's somebody else out there besides me who did not like this character because I feel so alone in this. Yeah, are you are you Team Slimester or Team Gakoid? Vote Gakoid for Brett, Slimester for Alex um, on the yes. face issue. And we'll post that on social media too when this episode <laughs> airs. All right, on to our coveted number one slot. dun 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 See, I, 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 I didn't do the face trumpet because after that discussion, it would do a disservice <laughs> no, to our can, number one. I will do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you have sullied my number one. Eh, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Um, so, yes. <laughs> For my number one, we've talked about it a little bit before because yes. it is Little Bear. I love Little Bear so much. I love him so much because I wish I adopted him as a kid. He is a cute, cuddly, anthropomorphic brown bear cub who hangs out in the forest with his anthropomorphic kind of sort of not really friends, duck, cat, hen, owl, and a human friend named Emily, along with her doll Lucy. And in in, in a sense, it does parallel Winnie the Pooh a lot 
um, like we'd mentioned before, because you got all these animal characters and this one human character just kind of hanging out in this in this biodome where nothing bad ever happens and we can just enjoy nature to the fullest. Occasionally, we would also run into other animal friends that we would see or help. They, they weren't necessarily part of like Little Bear's Posse, but we did revisit them on a few occasions. Like there was No Feet the Snake, which is pretty cool. Little Ick, this tiny raccoon who would just like hiccup and Ick. Hence his name. And uh, of course, there's the monkey Mitzi who moved into town from the jungle for God knows why. Oh, and Moose too. He was like <laughs> the big guy who just helped out when everyone screwed everything up. But this this had to be my non-negotiable number one because it felt like a storybook came to life every single time I watched it as a child. I love the theme song, you know, the Nick Jr. version, not like the regular version because there's an alternate version out there. I love the characters. I love the lessons that they introduced to us in a very soft, natural, like palatable way. I, I liked how Little Bear also interacted with some adult characters like his parents, Mother Bear and Father Bear. There's also Uncle Rusty, who was a bear that came in. Um, even uh, Emily's grandmother was there too. It felt like Everything you love about growing up as a child and reading storybooks, it's just that warm, fuzzy feeling that really like makes you feel safe and comfortable and like you can do anything and have the time of your life as friends. And I have to give my hats off to more illustrator Maurice Sendek for that because I just fell in love with his illustrations and it led me to other books he did like Where the Wild Things Are. I do have to mention that uh, some of my favorite episodes that stand out to me most are two in particular. Well, kind of three, but mostly two. Um, one where they befriend a bunch of otters at the lake and they go down a mudslide uh, into the lake. And it, I, w when that was on, it was like me and my sister, we grabbed a bunch of pillows, we tore apart the sofa and the chairs, and we made our own mudslide with, pi with pillows and slid down it because it looked so fun that we wanted to do it too. And there was also the Winter Solstice episode, which made me aware of seasons. And I also appreciated Wintermore as a result. With things like that being introduced into the episodes, it was just it was just a delight. It felt like Christmas whenever it came on. My number one, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about if it aired on Nick Jr., it counts. Because it is not a Nick original. A lot of people actually forget that this was on Nick Jr. There was a segment, an hour-long block, within Nick Jr. around 94 that was called the Jim Henson Muppet Hour. Interesting. I don't actually the, remember that that well. The first half, they played The Muppet Show. The second half, they played Muppet Babies. Ooh, and then, I love Muppet and Babies. Then, then later they did away with Muppet Babies, and it was just two block. No, originally it was yeah, it was it was that, and then it was just two hours of Muppets, uh, mm -hmm. the Muppet Show, and then on Saturdays they had Muppet Matinee, but it was on Nick Jr. Therefore, it counts. My favorite is the Muppet Show. I love. I loved the Muppets as a kid. I love the Muppets now. Uh, it was the only show that ever came on Nick Jr. that I got genuinely excited to watch. Uh, Muppet Babies, I grew up watching with my brother and love Muppet Babies. Uh, the, yeah. the new one, The new one that's out now, it, it, it's fine. It still gets me to laugh uh, occasionally, but it's, it's nothing like the original. The original was so fun and creative and was able to do a lot of pop culture references. <laughs> and at the time, there was no re-syndication of The Muppet Show. Uh, all there was was The Muppet Babies. And I, I watched that with my brother. And then The Muppet Christmas Carol hit the theaters. And then there was this huge resurgence of The Muppet Show again. And then they brought... I knew the show existed because my family had told me about it. And then to see that it was coming on Nick Jr., I was so looking forward to those days now when mm. I got to have those holidays and I was tuning in specifically to watch that. And then when they moved it to Saturdays, oh, such a relief. I can finally watch this show without having to wait on holidays now. It started over on Nick Jr. before it moved over to Saturdays on regular Nickelodeon. For those who are unfamiliar with what the concept for what the Muppet show was, it's they're putting on a show. They are in a theater it came on in the 70s and very early 80s. I think it was 76, and it ran through 81. I definitely know Elton John was a guest star in one of the episodes, so that, that yeah. tells you how old it is. 
and uh, in Star Wars, the Star Wars cast was yeah. on there in '77. Uh, Stallone was on there. I mean, they had all kinds oh, of guests man. on there. But it was it was a variety show. The the cast of the Muppets were trying to do a live performance on a theater stage, often heckled by Statler and Waldorf. It would be a wide variety of of segments. There'd be music. They'd be singing. There'd be insane stunts that Gonzo would try to do, uh, horrible jokes by Fozzie Bear, uh, <laughs> little comedy sketches with the the celebrities. And then often you'd see what was going on backstage and how things were just falling apart and Kermit was doing his best just to keep the show going. The one movie that closely talks about that is The Muppets. Mm. Uh, that I love that movie. But at the time, Up at Treasure Island hasn't wasn't out. It was just Muppet Christmas Carol, and mm-hmm. I got to really dive into all the other characters that you don't normally get to see in in the movies, uh, like Rolf. Uh, when Jim Henson died, Rolf never spoke again. Uh, that was his that was his favorite Muppet that he had created, and out of respect for him, he never spoke again until Muppets Most Wanted. I think. Hmm. So you see him, but he never spoke. He did a lot. Uh, Like there were doctor skits where he was the doctor and he would completely mess everything up and crack jokes while he's doing surgeries. And he would usually bring the house down. The whole show is just fun and insane and creative and made me smile from ear to ear. I might not have belly laughed very much, but... I just love to watch these characters and see the insane things that they do. And it's, I can't get enough of the Muppets. Even when they are at their, even when they were at the worst, it's still better than most things. Uh, I, I loved it as a kid and I love it now. I'll give you that. It's, it, there's a certain timelessness about the Muppets that you can always revisit them and it still feels fresh. My memories of the Muppet show aren't quite as vivid as yours, but I definitely have a lot of fond memories of Muppet Babies because I, I ate that up you know, whenever I, I saw it on. I, I remember like particularly attaching to Kermit, Animal, and Gonzo more than all the other characters <laughs> yes, because I could yes. identify with Gonzo as being a weirdo and an Animal just being like, goofy and off the walls all the time and kermit is like the leader trying to keep everything together i really love the legacy that jim henson left behind because you know whether it's muppet show muppet babies or any of the other countless shows that and movies he's worked on it's it can't be understated that you know not only is the man a genius but he he brought a lot of joy and light to the world as a result of his creativity who is your favorite muppet there's there's something i like about each of them which makes it hard I guess it, <laughs> if we're going with Muppet Show and not Muppet Babies, it'd be Beaker because I like seeing his head explode and talking like. <laughs> me, 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 me. My my favorite was Kermit. Mm. I mean, it, it, you you can't go wrong with Kermit. Can't go wrong until Muppets from Space hit the scene, Uh-oh. and then Pepe became my favorite. Pepe Le Pew uh, or Pepe the the shrimp? Pepe the Pepe the shrimp. Pepe the uh. king prong. Yeah. Love Pepe. Keeping things fresh off of uh, Think Fast to Make, or make the Grade from Episode 3, <laughs> I thought it'd be cool if we had like a couple segments that we just introduce here and there as they pop up or they seem appropriate. So I thought this time we would do a segment called This or That, where okay. essentially I will ask you to choose between two similar Nick Jr. shows and you go with your gut reaction and you know we we see what ones you come up with after 10 rounds so without further ado let's play this or that this or that this or that time to play this or that okay for round one of this or that alex elephant show or gullah gullah island elephant show round two maggie and the ferocious beast or dora the explorer gosh i didn't see either of them so i will not vote for dora the explorer so, so is that, with, uh, is that Maggie or that? abstain? <laughs> Maggie. Maggie. Okay. Round three, Little Bear or Rupert the Bear? Little Bear. I never saw an episode of Rupert. Fair enough. I've, uh, I've seen Rupert. It's very similar, but more British. Round four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Round four, Maisie or Kipper? Gosh, I haven't seen either of those ever. Kipper. Round five, Frank Capelli or Fred Penner? Penner. Round six, Eureka's Castle or Allegra's Window? Uh, castle. Rounds- no, no slight to Allegra, but... Round seven, Little Big Room or Ambient Dexter? Little Big Room. Round eight, 
Franklin or Oswald? Oswald. Round nine, Bob the Builder or Max and Ruby? Max and Ruby. And round 10, Wobbless World of Dr. Seuss or Busy World of Richard Scarry? Wobbless World of Dr. Seuss. I, I always prefer puppets over animation. How about you? I mean, I know you wrote these, but still, I'd like to know yours. Uh, Elephant Show or Gullah Gullah Island? I'm going to go with Elephant Show, though I still appreciate Gullah Gullah Island and... Oh, hold on, let me do the voice. Oh, can't do it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Maggie and the Ferocious Beast or Dora the Explorer? Maggie and the Ferocious Beast, 100%. Little Bear or Rupert the Bear? Going with Little Bear. Just stronger Can't memories for me. <laughs> Maisie or Kipper? I'm going to go with Maisie just because I used to watch that with my brother as well. And I used to do the voices. Like she would say like, ah, and ah. You know, it's like sound effects with their voices, not necessarily words. But I found it amusing. Frank Capelli or Fred Penner? I'm going to go with Fred Penner because even though I remember Frank Capelli and Capelli and company, he didn't leave a lasting enough impression on me. Fred Penner was cooler with his nature hideaway. Eureka's Castle or Allegra's Window? Well, I guess I have to go over Eureka's Castle because it's on my list, huh? <laughs> yeah. Or else I'd be a hypocrite. Little Big Room or Ambien Dexter? I'm going to go with Ambien Dexter because even though I like the puppets of Little Big Room, they did get on my nerves on a few occasions. But Ambien Dexter is like non-speaking and they like... There were these two little characters who would transform into hands and you got to find out like what the activity was that they were doing at the end of the short. So I appreciate that more. Franklin or Oswald? Uh, I'm going with Oswald because I thought Franklin the Blue Octopus was very charming. He had a very charming dog named Weenie who literally looked like a hot dog. And his uh, one of his best friends was um, a penguin. I forgot his name, but he was voiced by... Uh, I think Lenny from Laverne and Shirley. And I always loved his uh, voice for some reason. Bob the Builder or Max and Ruby? Going with Bob the Builder. My brother loved the show, had the toys growing up. My dad was in construction. Why not? Wobulous World of Dr. Seuss or a Busy World of Richard Scary? Gonna have to go with Busy World of Richard Scary. Love that art style. Love how busy that town was. Felt like an animal version of Where's Waldo to me. All right. Two bonus rounds. Blue or magenta? Gotta go with blue. And... They both were on Nickelodeon. One was originally Nickelodeon. The other one was on there for a very short time. Teletubbies or Yo Gabba Gabba? Uh, gonna go with Teletubbies because we actually had Poe, this the stuffed animal of Poe, and we used to <laughs> we used to watch along and make silly noises. So I don't like to admit that, but yeah, I watched Teletubbies <laughs> with my siblings growing up. Well, your your answers are mine as well, as much <laughs> as I do not like Yo Gabba Gabba. So yeah. I, Teletubbies is the lesser of two evils. Fair enough. Sorry, Shay. I know you liked Yo Gabba Gabba when we did our <laughs> junior poll last week, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was our list. Hope you guys enjoyed it uh, and are still with us after... All of our ranting, rabbling, and all things 90s Nick Jr. You know, let us know what you think of the episodes, how we're doing, what you'd like to hear from us for future topics. You can reach us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm mostly on Instagram, so you can contact me directly there at Splat Attack Podcast or uh, Brett Wilson Art or at True 90s Nickelodeon. You can also email us at splatattack2021 at gmail.com and leave us a rating review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And, you know, yeah, connect with us in any way you can. We love hearing from you guys, both Slimesters and Gakoids, whoever team you prefer to be on. And with that being said, we're going to go find some Blue's Clues with Little Bear at Eureka's Castle. Slime you later. Reprise the theme song and roll the credits. Hard to believe, folks, but it's time to say goodbye. Nighty night. Hey, check us out next time for more adventure and another great legend of the Hidden Temple. What will we do till then? Chill for a couple. We'll be back. You're on, Nick. And it was time for the superhero to move on. I declare this meeting of the Midnight Society closed. Oh, bye bye. Hey, all you slimesters and gakoids. Brett here. Just tuning in with some shout outs that we forgot to mention during the episode. So if you listen in and you gave us your answers on Instagram, then you will probably hear your answer. And we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to these episodes so far as we're growing our podcast and also interacting with us on social media. It means a lot to us that we're able to develop this sense of community with each other. And we hope we continue to do so with um, 
you know, picking topics that you're really interested in and also doing fun things like polls and quizzes online. So without further ado, let's jump right into the shout outs and see if you hear your name. Starting off with Weiss5828, he mentions that his favorite 90s Nick Jr. show is The Noodles, which I think has some koala bears in it. I don't remember it too well, but I'll have to go back and look at it. It's a good pick. Uh, Brianna June goes with Eureka's Castle, The Elephant Show, and David the Gnome, which are also all three great shows. Surprised David the Gnome didn't make my list, but I thought it was later in the afternoon than on Nick Jr. Still still solid. It's very similar to like Little Bear in the sense that it takes place mainly in the woods and helping forest animals. Uh, ben Bink888 says he likes Blue's Clues. Can't go wrong with Blue. Adam AC Lind 84 says uh, Eureka's Castle is a great show, and he also won a radio calling contest because of it. Very cool. Would love to hear more about that story. Well, Evelyn Kovacs says that her favorite is Gullah Gullah Island. Definitely a great show. I'm surprised it didn't make our list, but it would probably be like a number six. Very close call uh, if we extended the list from five to ten. Nick Hoimi says Eureka's Castle, David the Gnome, Maya the Bee, Little Bits, and The Elephant Show. Again, all great picks. A lot of picks, actually. Um, starting to see some overlap here with Eureka's Castle and Elephant Show that were also on our list, which were great. And also love to hear more people. Actually, and also love to... That was big for me, too, growing up. So great picks, Nick. Uh, ben McDermott, 93, says The Wubbulous World of Dr. Seuss. Definitely love the puppetry going on in that show and how it, uh, faithful it is to like the art style of Dr. Seuss children's books. So that's another great one. Uh, Flaming Head 25 says Little Bill. Not not that popular, but I do remember seeing it growing up, so not bad. And Justin Farrell goes with Blue's Clues and Little Bear. Awesome. They were both on both of our lists, which is great to hear. Uh, Herby Soft, my friend Lewis, says Little Bear as well. And also Call Me Clemens says Little Bear. And he's, he adds, nothing even comes close. Wow. Well, it's a good thing. Good thing that it made my number one because um, it, it, it seems like it, it definitely sits deep in our hearts with um, not just me, but other 90s Nick kids as well. So I'm glad to hear that. Uh, map 62789 goes with Allegra's Window and Gullah Gullah Island, both great shows that aired in the mid 90s of Nick Jr.'s run. Appreciate that. Nostalgia, duh goes with uh, Oswald or Franklin. And I'm surprised we didn't actually mention that on our list because I actually like both shows, but I think they would have been two close calls as well as Gullah Gullah Island just because they were very similar to like Richard Scary or Little Bear, uh, just slightly different. Uh, I, I just couldn't think of any like deep memories to separate them from the other shows that we've mentioned. But they're also quality shows. So thank you for mentioning that, Nostalgia Duh. Uh, Shay's Awesome goes with Allegra's Window and Gullah Gullah Island, and later, Yo Gabba Gabba for her girls. All great picks, yeah. Yeah, I definitely tuned into those shows, especially with my sister in the 90s. Luis Velez, 82, goes with Eureka's Castle. K-pop Disney Swift, 19, goes with Blue's Clues, also on our list, very great. Slimy's Dream goes with Gullah Gullah, no question. Busy World of Richard Scary comes close, too. Glad to hear that, Slimy's. Ron Cena Diva goes with Blue's Clues and Rugrats. I don't think Rugrats act technically aired on Nick Jr., but, you know, since it's baby-themed, I guess I'll count it. It's still a great show. Um, but, yeah, good picks. T. Mason says, As someone who grew up when Nick Jr. was first introduced, I'll have to go with The Elephant Show, of course. Yeah, yeah. Getting some of those uh, early 90s fans coming out of the woodwork to uh, show their love. I appreciate that, Tara. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Hank King Tattoos, who says Little Bear. Duh. It was the best one ever made, period. Couldn't have said it better myself, Hank. Appreciate you chiming in with us, as well as all the rest of you. So if you ever see any future polls that we mention on our episodes, uh, feel free to let us know on Instagram at Splat Attack Podcast, and maybe we might do some more shoutouts. So stay tuned, Slimesters. Splat you later. <laughs> Greetings. Hello. How do you do? <laughs> it's me, Faith. And every Friday, saying goodbye makes me blue. Because I won't see you again for two whole days. So today, I think I'll say hello 
instead of goodbye. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> and I'll see you next week, right here on Nick Jr. <laughs> <laughs>